who has been to my class and Dr. Elham Hussain from the College, Department of English. And our today's topic is the rhyme of the ancient mariner, written by S.T. Coleridge or Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And you know that Samuel Taylor Coleridge is one of the co in English literature. And he was born in 1772. And he was a friend. He was a friend of William Wurzel. And it is said that in contact of William Wurzel, Samuel Taylor Coleridge developed his uh, liking or developed his love of nature. Actually, Wordsworth was fascinated by nature at first. Coleridge was not a poet of nature. But while Coleridge came in contact with Wordsworth in 1796 and they became friends, they started living in Lake District. And it is said that uh, S.T. Coleridge used to sit at the feet of William Wordsworth. That is, Wordsworth was his guru or his uh, master from whom he learned a lot of things, a lot of things about uh, the theory of poetry, about nature, and about contemporary philosophy. So Wordsworth had a very profound influence on S.T. Coleridge. And Wordsworth and Coleridge decided to write poetry. And they decided to publish a book of poetry. But before doing that, they divided their subject matter. That is, on what subject matter would they write? Wordsworth decided that he would write uh, about uh, nature that would appear supernatural. That is, nature would be portrayed in his poems in such a way that it would appear to be supernatural. And Coleridge decided to write about supernatural elements. That is, he would treat supernaturalism in such a way that it would appear to be nature. So these are the two different tracks that Wordsworth and Coleridge decided for their writings. And they followed the tracks very uh, meticulously or very uh, faithfully. Now, <clears throat> in 1798, Wordsworth and Coleridge published Lyrical Ballads. Lyrical Ballads is a book of poetry. There were 23 poems, and 19 poems were written by Wordsworth, and only four poems were written by S.T. Coleridge. And this Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner was one of the four poems of uh, S.T. Coleridge that appeared in Lyrical Ballads in 1798. Now, <clears throat> you know that this very poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Marina, is one of the major poems and this is the longest poem of S.T. Coleridge. Coleridge has written uh, some other poems which are also very healthy in size, but this very poem, that is Rhyme of the Ancient Marina, is the <clears throat> longest poem uh, of all the poems that Coleridge has ever written. Now, if I ask you about the inspiration behind writing this rhyme of the ancient marina, then what would be your answer? You know that this poem, the rhyme of the ancient marina, was inspired by a dream. 
and many people uh, call it a dream poem as Kubla Khan, another poem of S.T. Coleridge, uh, one of the masterpieces of Coleridge, is also called a dream poem. This, the rhyme of the ancient marina is also called a dream poem. So why? Because it is said that you will get this information in the book, Romantic Imagination. And the book is written by C.M. Bowra. In that very book, you will find this information that one of the friends of William Wordsworth, uh, Mr. Cruikshank, once Cruikshank dreamt a dreadful dream that, that uh, a ship got stuck in a perilous sea and the sailors could not drink the salty sea water. They were dying of thirst then the ship of death came and took away the souls of the suffering sailors. Actually, that was the content of the dream. That was the content of the dream that was dreamed by uh, Cruikshank. Then Cruikshank narrated that dream to William Wordsworth. And Wordsworth started writing this book. But he could not continue or he could not finish this poem. Actually, the subject matter did not, was probably, did not suit his temper. Because you know that this poem is based on supernatural incidents. And Coleridge's subject matters uh, were nature and elements of nature. But this poem is mostly based on supernatural elements. For that reason, the subject matter did not suit the temperament of William Wordsworth. So William Wordsworth left this poem for S.T. Coleridge. And Coleridge took up the poem and he finished it very successfully. So the outline or the structure of this poem has come from William Wordsworth. This is a very important information and you must remember this. The structure of this poem has come from William Wordsworth. But if Wordsworth could not finish it. Anyway, this is one of the inspirations that walked behind the composition of the Rhyme of the Ancient Marina. And the critics say that there is another uh, historical incident that inspired this poem. And what is that incident? That was the navigation of Captain James Cook. You know that Captain James Cook was a great navigator and he, along with some of his disciples, went to Australia. And in the middle of the sea, many of his companions were infected or affected by scurvy. Scurvy, you know, it's a skin disease and it is caused by the deficiency of vitamin C. So uh, of this disease, many of the companions of Captain James Cook died in the sea. And that very story, especially the second journey of Captain James Cook to Australia or in the uh, uh, Ant Antarctica, in Antarctica, uh, this very story was very popular among the English during that time. And that very historical story inspired Coleridge to compose this poem. Uh, there is another story behind the composition of this poem. Uh, that is Godwin's philosophy. You know that William Godwin was a very popular philosopher of uh, that very particular time. And Godwin's philosophy Pantisocracy, the philosophical ideology that Godwin uh, propagated or that Godwin uh, proclaimed was called popularly termed as Pantisocracy. Pantisocracy is an ideology which uh, tells us about a utopian world, that is the world 
in which everybody is equal or where everybody will be treated equal. That is the content of Pentisocracy. That is Pentisocracy says that there will be a world, there will be a utopia where all the people, where everybody will be equally treated. That was the uh, philosophy regarding Pentiso crazy. And uh, you know that Coleridge was influenced by that very philosophy. And Coleridge's another friend, uh, Sade, Sade was a prominent poet of that time. He was also influenced by that philosophy. And at that time, you know that they were very young. And if you think of the year of birth of S.T. Coleridge, that is Coleridge was born in 1772. And this poem was published in 1798. So only at the age of 26, this poem was published. So Coleridge was a man of 26 at that time. A very young man, full of enthusiasm, vigor, and freshness. So he was influenced by that philosophy. And you know that the other successive romantic poets, for example, Parsivishi Shelley, uh, then uh, Lord Byron, John Keats, they were also influenced by the philosophy of William Godwin. That is, the, there will be a world where everybody will be uh, equal. Actually, that very philosophy worked in the mind of Godwin and his disciples because at that time capitalism was flourishing and the difference between the poor and the rich was getting wider. So it was really a very critical time. The society was mostly divided into two groups. One was of the rich people and the other was of the poor people. So there was no equal, e equality in the society. And all the privileges were enjoyed by the rich people. And the poor people were deprived of all the privileges, amenities, facilities of life. The poor people were not considered to be citizens. They were considered to be subjects. And the rich people were considered to be citizens. And you, you must know the difference between a citizen and a subject. A subject is uh, equivalent to slaves who does not have any right that should be fortified by the constitution of a country. A subject, a subject's duty is to show his subjugation or submission to the master. So that was the condition of the society. That was the social reality or economic reality of that time. And most probably because of that uh, injustice that was uh, prevailing in the society, some poets who were very much rational and who were well-educated and who had very close contact with uh, philosophies developed this sort of attitude that is there would be a world which should be uh, which will ensure uh, equal treatment for everybody so most probably because of that uh, philosophical uh, involvement Coleridge wrote this poem in this poem we will find that the ancient marina set sail to the south sea with his 200 companions and went to the South Sea. And that was a very exotic world, uh, far away from the din and bustle of day-to-day -day life. And before going to the content of the poem, I just like to uh, tell you uh, something about the genre or about the type of this book. You know that the rhyme of the ancient mariner is popularly known as a ballad. So what is a ballad? Ballad is a long narrative poem which is characterized by the short stanza form. A ballad tells a story in the form of 
poetry. So ballad is a story. Just remember this. Ballad is a story. But story is usually told in prose. But in a ballad, a story is told in the form of poetry or with the help of rhyme schemes, with the help of meter, uh, with the help of other uh, prosodic elements. For that reason, we call it a ballad. Actually, ballad form is not a new invention of stick language. Ballad was a very old form of poetry, and it was very popular among the Normans. And while Normans conquered Britain in 1066, you know that this very year in the history of England is popularly known as the year of Norman conquest, that is 1066. So while the Normans came to England, they brought many things with them. They brought uh, with them their narratives, their discourse, their literature, their stories, their folk tales, their beliefs, their disbeliefs. So all these things they brought with them to England. So ballad was uh, imported by Normans. It was a very popular form of, it was a very popular form of, uh, uh, it was a very popular form of poetry among the Normans, they brought it to England and ultimately it became popular in England. So ballad was a medieval form of poetry. You know medievalism, it is said that medievalism usually uh, indicates the span of time from 850 to the uh, death of Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer, that is 1400, or many people say 1450. So this very span of time in the history of English literature is popularly known as medieval period. And medievalism, you know that medievalism is the reason anything regarding medieval period or medieval lifestyle, medieval way of thinking, medieval attitudes, etc., etc. And you know that during that very medieval period, uh, romantic elements, for example, the spirit, these are all Gothic elements, ghosts, then uh, supernatural elements. These were very popular subject matters of medieval literature. And in this very poem, you will find these elements uh, very widely used by Estic Quirkage. So people say that this rhyme of the ancient marina is remarkable for medievalism. So why? Because if you think of the form of this poem, that is if you think that it's a ballad, ballad is a medieval uh, genre. So this is one of the medieval elements used by Coleridge in this poem. Then if you think of the archaic words, archaic means old fashioned or archaic means obsolete. Obsolete means which is not usually used today. Suppose many things or many fashions, many styles that were very popular 50 years ago uh, are not today followed by the people, the modern people, the today's people. So those fashions we usually call obsolete fashions. Understand? Suppose the style of pants that Nayok Raz Razak usually put on in the Bengali film of 60s and 70s, uh, that type of pants are not put on by our today's young men. So that very fashion is called an archaic fashion or obsolete fashion. So archaism or archaic words that Coleridge has used in his poems uh, give the readers 
a flavor of medieval period. For example, he has uh, used the words Eptsuns. Eptsuns is not a is not a, a word used today. Today we use at once or immediately. So at once is a current word, and Eptsuns is an archaic word. Coleridge has used this word Epsons in his poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Marina. Another word, suppose Kark, K I R K. Kark. Actually, at present, we do not use this word Kark. We use church. So, church is a prayer home or prayer house for the Christians. Coleridge has used this word uh, Kark. That is an archaic word. Archaic word means the word which is not used today, but that was used in the past. So in this way, Coleridge has used archaic words and given this poem a flavor of many people. And while he has told us about a ship which was mostly driven by the sails, not by the steam engines, so that very ship also goes with the medieval period because during medieval period we did not find uh, any steamship. So the ship is also itself is a medieval element. And you will find the reference to the spirits. The spirit after the killing of Albatross, you know, that very spirit became vindictive and took revenge upon the sailors. So this Gothic element this ghostly spirit is also a very popular element of medieval literature. In medieval literature, the spirits like uh, this were very commonly used in the literature of that time. Or if you think of the voices that the ancient mariner heard towards the end of this poem, you will find that the ancient mariner heard two voices in the air. And these two voices went on with a conversation regarding the course of fate of the ancient mariner. That is what he would uh, suffer from, or what would be the consequence of killing of the cross. Uh, these things came out of the conversation of two spirits, two, two voices from the air. So these are the elements that Coleridge has borrowed from medieval uh, literature medieval sources. So these are medieval elements. Okay. So at the very outset, I have told you about the uh, inspiration that worked behind the composition of this text. And another important thing uh, regarding the subject matter. The subject matter was not Coleridge's contemporary uh, subject matter. Coleridge has borrowed the subject matter from the medieval period. Now, I uh, like to tell you about another important aspect of this text. Uh, it is this poem today is widely read as an ecological poem. Remember, it's a very important poem. Today, we read this poem as an ecological poem. So, why? or it can be read, it can be analyzed, this poem can be criticized eco-critically. So why should we call it an ecological poem? You know, ecology, our surrounding nature, it's a system, and this system involves all the elements of this universe. It involves human beings. It involves the rivers, the seas, the birds, the volcanoes, or even the insects that we cannot see, uh, that can be seen only through magnifying glasses. So all these things, all these elements belong to our ecology. And ecology is just like a chain. And if you break the chain, what will happen? If you break the chain, you will find an anarchy. You will find a sort of indiscipline. If you break discipline, 
then what will happen? You will find that some uh, abnormal uh, activities or some abnormal consequences are emerging out of your audacity or out of your foolishness. So, ecology is our system. And if you break the system, your foolishness will make you suffer. And today, what do we see all around us? We, we are blaming uh, that global warming is going on or the sea level is rising. And we are alarmed that within 50 years or 100 years, the lower southern parts of our country will go underwater. We are very much anxious regarding our future. So why? Because we say that emission of carbon dioxide burning of fossil fuel, cutting down of trees, all these foolish activities of mankind or all these irrational activities of mankind are responsible or these uh, foolish activities will bring about our destru destruction in, in future. Okay, so ecology is a very important chain and we must maintain this chain very carefully. And if you read this text, what do we find? We find that the ancient mariner along with his 200 companions went to the South Sea. And towards the beginning of their journey, they had a very happy experience. They were very happy because the breeze was blowing. You know, uh, I may quote for your convenience from this poem. The fair breeze blew, the white foam flew, the pharaoh followed free. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. So just mark Coleridge's sense of music. Coleridge has employed alliteration here. The pharaoh followed free. That is repetition of F sound, that is consonant sound. Repetition of consonant sound is usually called alliteration. So towards the beginning of the journey, the sailors were very really happy. They were full of enthusiasm. But ultimately, they happened to reach a silent sea. That is the sea where there was no bird and there was no other animal. Nothing was seen there. It seemed there was no trace of life. In such a very a uh, perilous sea, silent sea. The ship of the sailors uh, were uh, surrounded by icebergs. The icebergs were all around. You know icebergs? You have seen this iceberg in the film Titanic. And you know that Titanic uh, uh, was, uh, Titanic sank into the Atlantic because of its collision with an ice bar. So there were ice bars all around. And Coleridge has described the ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and groaned and roared and howled like noises in a shout. So Coleridge's sense of onomatopoeia, that is the words that he has used uh, in these lines, produce natural sound. For that reason, we call it onomatopoeia. So anyway, in such a very critical or crucial moment, or in such a very predicament, suddenly an albatross came, came to the ship of the sailors. And at first, the sailors took this albatross to be a bar of uh, good fortune or good luck. So they gave it food and water. And albatross became very tame. But one day, out of curiosity or out of whim, he did not have any uh, particular reason. Actually, this poem is also uh, this poem is also about the treatment of the conflict between rationality and irrationality. Remember this: rationality and irrationality. We have two sides of our mind rational and, and irrational. If we behave rationally, 
then our life will be happy. But if we go against our reason, our sensibility, then we must suffer. So this poem, uh, you, you must not read this poem superficially. It's a very multi-layered poem. It is a psychoanalytical poem also. While you will recite this poem, you will find that it analyzes human mind. It takes you to, uh, it takes you to a journey into human soul, where you will find two sides. You will find conflict between these two sides, that is rational and irrational. These two sides are always at conflict. And if the rational side conquers or overcomes the irrational side, then everything will be okay. But if your rationality will be overpowered by your irrationality, then you must be doomed. You will have to suffer. Actually, this poem is also a poem about the conflict between rationality and irrationality. And this is also a poem about guilt and redemption. That is, while you go against your rationality, you commit a crime. That is your guilt. And what will happen then? You will suffer. And when you will come back to your rationality, then you will have redemption. So this poem is about guilt and redemption. Okay. So anyway, the... Ancient mariner shot the albatross. And immediately after shooting the albatross, the weather became clear. You know, there was fog before, but after shooting the uh, albatross, the uh, weather became very clear. Then the sailors uh, thought that, then the sailors. At first, I, I just like to take you back uh, that while the albatross was shot by the, the old sailor, the sailors blamed the old sailor that he had done a misdeed or he had committed a misdeed. But immediately after the uh, shooting of the albatross, uh, while the weather became clear, while the fog dispersed, then the sailors uh, appreciated his kill. So just mark the dual nature of human psychology. While you were in your advantageous position, then your attitude is uh, one uh, type is of one time and while you are in disadvantages your attitude will be of another time so you are a single person but your attitudes vary from situation to situation and the variety of your attitudes depend on the uh, the the advantages or privileges that you are enjoying if you are enjoying privileges your attitude will be positive and if you are devoid of privileges, if you think that you are in an uneasy situation, then your attitude will be quite different or opposite to the previous attitude. This is human nature. So human beings always do not behave rationally. Man's behavior is mostly guided, mostly motivated by the situation in which he is or she is. So that is also, uh, that is an important aspect of this poem. And for that reason, I have told you that it is about psychoanalysis. This poem is a psychoanalytical poem also. It's an ecological poem also. Okay. So anyway, the ship automatically sailed to the silent sea. And there the wind dropped. The sun came up above the heads above the mast of the uh, ship and it is started sh to shower uh, fire upon the sailors and as there was no wind the ship could not move in such a very critical situation their supply of drinking water was exhausted 
their supply of drinking water was exhausted and they could not drink the saline water of the sea and the sailors out of their sufferings. In the silent sea, uh, the sailors out of sufferings, that is why they were suffering from thirst, they hanged the dead body of Albatross around the neck of the old sailor. It was a kind of punishment. And you know that from that very incident, uh, we get a phrase, idiomatic phrase in English language, that is the dead body of Albatross around one's neck. It's an idiomatic phrase, very popular idiomatic phrase the dead body of albatross around one's neck. That is the burden of punishment or burden of sin. <clears throat> In such a very precarious situation, while the sailors could not drink the salty sea water, and because of hunger and because of extreme thirst, their ability of speaking also was extinguished, they could not speak also. In such a very crucial moment, one day the old sailors saw a ship coming towards them. That very old sailor saw the ship coming towards them. And immediately he shouted, a sail, a sail, he shouted in joy. And the other sailors were also very happy but they did not have the compatibility to speak. They did not have the ability to speak. They were physically very weak and faint. They could not speak. So ultimately the ship came. While the ship came to them, they were horrified. At first they were happy, but while the ship approached and it neared, they became very much uh, frightened. They got frightened. Why? Because it was not an ordinary ship. It was a phantom ship. It looked like a shadow of a ship because the sun was visible through the main body of the ship. So it was really a horrible experience for all the sailors. And there were no crew on that very ship. There were only a woman with red bright lips and dead white skin and her companion was Death himself. Actually it was the sheep of death. And that very sheep of death took away all the souls of the suffering sailors to the land of death and went out. But mysteriously the old sailor was left alone. So how can you interpret this or how, how can you interpret that the sole criminal, that is the man who was the killer of Albatross, was left alive and the other persons uh, were taken away to the land of the one. It has got different interpretations. One interpretation is that the other sailors were doubly responsible for the killing of Albatross. You know that if you commit a crime, you are guilty. And if your friend supports your crime, she or he is also guilty. So committing crime is a guilt and supporting a crime is also a guilt. While the old sailor shot the Albatross, the other sailors at first criticized him that he had done a misdeed. It proved that they were not sympathetic towards their friend. The old sailor was their friend. So while they criticized him, blamed him for killing the Albatross, it proved that they uh, were not sympathetic with their friend. And another interpretation is that while the atmosphere became congenial, while the fog dispersed, and while a fair 
atmosphere prevailed, then the sailors appreciated the killing of albatross. That is, they supported the guilt. So they committed two sins, but the old sailor committed one sin. So the sailors, other sailors were a doubly criminal. This is one interpretation. Another interpretation is that the old sailor was left alone to suffer more. When you die, you escape the punishment. And when you are alive in the midst of punishment, you are dying at every moment. So when you die, that is a single death. But while you are not dying, you are in the midst of punishment. You are dying at every moment. That is uh, more uh, cruel or that is more uh, agonizing than uh, a singular death. For that reason, the old sailor was left alone. He was left alone to suffer more. He was left alone to learn a lesson that nobody can break the chain of ecology. If anybody breaks the chain of ecology, then he will bring about death and disaster for everybody. Not only for him, but also for everybody. That is the lesson that he learned from his from his sufferings. So anyway, in, in such a very crucial moment, he had to spend seven days and for seven days, he tried to pray to God for mercy, but there was no spate of mercy. Uh, even he did not feel any spate of kindness in his own mind. It was really a very uh, critical juncture in his life. He could neither pray to God nor feel any sort of kindness inside him for any kind of animals all around him. Actually, he was floating on a sea which looked like the uh, cauldron of the witches in which the witches are boiling some ugly things or oil. It seems they are boiling oil with some ugly uh, things that you, you, you may find in Macbeth, Shakespeare's Macbeth. You will find the witches who were preparing a special kind of dish for them with some um, things. So anyway, in such a very predicament, the old sailor had to suffer for seven days. After seven days, suddenly it started raining. It started raining. That is, he fell into a deep sleep. So why did he fall into a deep sleep? Just immediately before that very incident, he found some water snake swimming uh, around the ship. So he praised their colors. He praised them. As soon as he praised them, the dead body of the albatross fell into the sea. Actually, this is the nucleus of this poem, and this is the major point, the focal point of this poem. And from this very point, the moral lesson of this poem emerges. So what is the moral lesson? That is, if you show your sympathy to any creature, indirectly you show sympathy to the creator. If you praise any creature, indirectly you praise the creator. So for praising creator, you need not go to the creator. You should just look around and find the beauties of the creation. If you appreciate the creation, you appreciate the creator. Actually, that is the major lesson of a man's life. And that is also one of the major lessons of the life of the ancient Maria. So anyway, after showing sympathy for the water snakes, the uh, dead body of Albatross fell into the sea and sank 
into the sea and the old sailor fell into a deep sleep while he woke up he found that it was rain the rain is a symbol of blessing symbol of comfort actually this poem is remarkable for religious use of symbols and images you will find the sea sea is a symbol of the whole universe sea is a symbol of ecology also and you know that this uh, albatross is also a symbol it's an archetype it's a symbol of uh, the dead body of albatross is a symbol of uh, albatross is a symbol of link between human beings and the ecology and you will also find the sky sky is another symbol the seascape the skyscape are described very delicately and colorfully the images or the images that have been used here uh, have added new dimensions to the meanings and interpretations of this text okay so then ultimately what happens ultimately the old sailor uh, found that the ship is started moving the ship mysteriously started moving this is a mysterious incident or supernatural incident and then he heard two voices in the air and the conversation of these two voices made it clear that the ship would go back to the native land of the old sailor and his punishment would be over very soon and uh, he would have to suffer more also though his punishment would be over but he would have to suffer more and ultimately the ship approached the seashore and then we find another skiff boat on which we find that man two men that one was harvey and the other was a captain and the captain boy was also there these three persons came to the ship and suddenly there was a bang from down uh, or from the bottom of the sea and because of that very shattering sound the ship went into uh, water and the old sailor started floating on the water and ultimately he was rescued he was rescued by the uh, hermit and the captain boy and he was taken to the land and the old sailor uh, told the marriage guest the marriage guest whom we meet at the very outset of this poem and whom the old sailor narrated the story of his journey to the south sea so he told the marriage guest that he from all these sufferings had learned a lesson a moral lesson and he feels an urge inside him to teach this lesson to the other people and that is his punishment that is the agony that from time to time returns inside him so what's that agony that very agony forces him to to uh, uh, transmit or to take this lesson that he has learned in in the sea to to the other people so that they can be wiser they can be uh, sagacious so what is that moral lesson that he has learned he prayed well who loved it well both men and birds and beasts he prayed best who loved it best all things both great and small for the dear god who loved us he made and loved the all actually this is the moral lesson that the ancient mariner has learned from his subjects so this very moral teaching may be a key note a key message that must be implemented for maintaining ecological balance the albatross may uh, seem to be a trivial animal but it is an important part of our ecosystem 
So it does not matter whether it is a, a, a magnificent thing or a trivial thing. The matter is that the matter that we have to be concerned is the link. Every object of this ecology are inevitably, they are inevitably linked in a chain. And if we break this chain, at any part of this chain, if we cause any damage, it will bring death and destruction, death and disaster for everybody. And if you be careful to this ecosystem, that would be your best, uh, best task. That would be your best prayer. So what is the definition of prayer? Prayer means praise. Prayer means subjugation. Prayer means your appreciation. You pray to something means you appreciate that very thing. You pray to something means you show your subjugation to that very thing. So we show we should show our uh, careful attitude, or we should do behave. We should behave carefully with our ecosystem. If we become callous and if we break the chain of ecosystem, that will bring death and disaster, not only to us individually, but also to everybody all, the, uh, all over the world. Actually, this is the message that Coleridge has given here. So you must not call it a religious poem. You can say that it is uh, the moral lesson tells us about uh, God. Uh, of course, it has got a religious flavor, but it is not a religious poem at all. You can interpret this poem from different perspectives. You can interpret this poem from religious perspective. You can interpret it from eco-critical perspective. You can interpret it from the modern uh, uh, economic perspective or sociological perspective. You can also interpret this poem uh, from a historical perspective, okay? Because you can connect the uh, content of this poem to the history or historical realities related to Captain James Cook and colonizing enterprises uh, that was initiated by the European navigators. So this poem has got a multi-layered uh, ground on which we, just like archaeologists, dig deeper and deeper and deeper and we will find the relics of meaning, meanings there. So anyway, no more today. Uh, thank you very much. And I will meet you in my next class with some new topics. So till then, stay tuned. Thank you very much.